everyone, and welcome back to Transportation Inside. This is the podcast where we dive into the hottest freight market topics, trends, and of course, insights. I'm your host, Peter Sand, Chief Analyst at Sonetta, and today I'm absolutely delighted to bring a very special guest around. My guest today is Chris Kosmala. Chris is consulting on transforming business with digital automation, or literally, he's a logistics jack of all trades, as he may call himself. And I would like to know a bit more about what that actually means, said Chris. I mean, in your quest to optimize supply chains, this does sound intriguing. Let me know, Chris. Where are you joining us from today? Because um, you are all over the place and all over the world to me, it seems. So please, a brief moment to introduce yourself. And, and are you calling us from the moon? Uh, well, it's, uh, sometimes it feels like it. It's uh, the antipodes. Obviously, logistics is a global business. Uh, transportation of goods is a global business. So you sometimes, as a consultant, you have to be uh, just about everywhere on a moment notice. It's a dynamic business, so it also requires you to turn on a dime and you know change the direction, um, uh, uh, work across multiple time zones. Uh, I think it's a business as usual to uh, to many many of us working in this uh, in this business. And I have say with decades of working for uh, both shippers or sometimes we refer to them as a beneficial cargo owners. Uh, for companies that provide the transportation of the goods for those shippers, and also for the companies in the middle, you know, trying to uh, facilitate uh, the trade moving uh, from place A to uh, to place B. I've seen uh, a lot of projects. I work on a lot of projects in capacity, in a consulting capacity, and I think that uh, I'm really looking forward to this uh, to this discussion because the topic that you mentioned to me um, uh, ahead of our call. Um, are really, really interesting. And I, and I think this is the right time to discuss them following the three intense years of dealing with pandemic and all of the measures that threw chaos into a chaos that is typically day-to-day -day logistics and day-to-day -day supply chain management. And I totally agree with you, Chris. It's been havoc out there. It's been crazy from day one, first with no one knowing anyone, then knowing just a little bit, then wanting to know it all with having no real place to go for, for, for getting that. But, but thanks for that brief introduction. So now hopefully everyone knows about you, those that have been living under a rock and not following you on, on LinkedIn or, or, or being a relatively active uh, contributor to uh, well thought leadership in in the uh, transforming business uh, world with uh, with digital and automation so so let's get right through it uh, and 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 stop chatting uh, all the time away on what has happened in the past because digitalization to me is definitely also something that is important for the future and 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 I have asked you up front here Chris to uh, to continue down the road that uh, that the first uh, transportation insight uh, podcast uh, laid down a list a top three list for you to pick the most important ones in terms of digitalization that is relevant for the container shipping industry. I've asked you also to uh, to focus very much on uh, digitalization that. That relates mostly to uh, to shippers and BCOs, yep. uh, knowing, of course, that many of the initiatives also come from from carriers and freight forwarders. So, hopefully, as always, this podcast is something to uh, to 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 take away for for everyone involved in global logistics. So, without further ado, please uh, let me know your your top three of the most important digital mm -hmm. inventions or digital tools around in the business right here, right now. Well, it's, they, you know, when you think about this uh, this business of digitalization, right? We're, we're not talking about inventions because the issue over here is not inventing something uh, anew. We 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 do have all of the pieces in place, and we do actually understand what it is that we want from the shipper's perspective. And that was very interesting, right? Because we, we're um, uh, the most important topic 
to them prior to the pandemic was visibility. This visibility was such an all-encompassing term, and a lot of companies kind of jump into this, providing what they said was their version of visibility, right? They all claim to have complete visibility, but essentially each one of them had a slightly uh, different version and different view. Uh, the venture capital piled in behind them because, you know, essentially we, if everybody's talking about visibility, well, we can put money into, into a, a good place that can potentially derive uh, uh, significant margins out of providing that visibility, right? So that was the hot topic just before pandemic. And then during pandemic, it really exploded, right? Because everybody needed to know instantaneously where their stuff is because the stuff was getting delayed rather than a couple of weeks or a week. It was getting into months or quarters. Now, that's a huge issue for the supply chains, right? Because when you're looking at the planning cycles, anywhere between six and 13 weeks, a quarter delay on a goods that you depend on, either as an input materials to your production or as something that you're going to resell as a, let's say, a retailer, um, a visibility is hugely important. But then, so is that the uh, most important one or is that well, you're making it to the podium? Well, you asked me about the three, and I, and I think mm -hmm. what I want to say is our view of visibility has evolved significantly. Companies assumed, many, many software companies innovating into the space, assumed that visibility is all about essentially telling the customer when the container or containers of the shipment will arrive. And to this, um, you know, they, they, they looked at the world and they said, well, we can pick up one form of a signal and transform this into another form of signal, which tells essentially the client where the trade is. As an example, if I know that a particular uh, 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 set of containers or container got loaded on a the ship, then if I track the a signal of that ship, which is AIS, okay, uh, which, which essentially tells me the position of the ship, I could derive information about the assumed arrival time, okay, rather than an estimated arrival time, kind of make it into the closer to real arrival time and give it to the customer. And that was perceived to be a great value, right? Because uh, a container line is not obligated essentially to provide information about the arrival of the ship, let's say maybe uh, until a few days to the port, right? So then the port knows, then the port adjusts essentially their schedule to provide services like palletage, anchorage, whatever. And um, and then the terminal, right, which says, well, I'm occupied. Um, I may not be able to take you in right now, but, you know, when you come, I will try to serve you as a first come, first serve. So that actually happened to be discussed as a, as a, as a value. But in the end, we learned over the pandemic but that this is not where the value is being derived. So let's say the companies that got this huge backings from, uh, from uh, VCs, you know, an example here, you know, probably abound, but the best known is probably Project 44. It's, it's, actually, it's actually providing aspect of visibility, but the, the, there are other two topics, and I think they're, they're very important for everybody to understand. As a shipper, I don't want visibility where my stuff is at a particular time or where it was yesterday. It's about causality. And causality means... I would like to know if the handler of my goods, my container, whether it's a carrier who has a possession of my containers, whether it's a freight forward, whether there is a transporter between my dock and the origin port or, uh, or destination port and my dock at the destination, what the decisions they're making which may affect movement of my cargo? Because these decisions are not made on the spot. They're not operational decisions. They're, they're taken a few days in advance. When a carrier decides to roll your load, okay, your, your transport, they know about these days in advance. They don't make this decision on a, on an hour notice. And the rolling of the cargo means that the cargo transit time may actually take a little bit longer than you originally predicted. Plus, it may arrive on a different ship, which means the IMO number changes. 
So while you from uh, from uh, the example that I gave from Project 44, you're receiving insight into the IMO number of that particular ship, saying, "Well, this particular ship will arrive in Los Angeles on a on a particular day." Well, hello, your cargo may not be on it because the carrier already made week in advance decision to roll, and you're actually coming on another ship. It's three days later, okay? It will be still within the transit time that you did agree. So there was agreement between the, the shipper and uh, and uh, and uh, carrier, okay? Yeah. So, so that's okay, but it's three days later. So if you're arranging your transports, ground transportation, okay, on the basis of the derived information, like the one that you, mm -hmm. you bought from uh, Project 44, then you may actually miss it by, by days. And with tracking business, you cannot reserve somebody for three days and just sit over there and wait for your load, right? Even if your load is delayed. This business moves on a very different time frames, on a different horizons, has their own very specific margin objectives. So, so therefore, they will be behaving yet in a very unpredictable way to you. So that's an example. Chris, so, uh, relaying this kind of, uh, say, causality information from, from, the, uh, from the carrier to the, to the shippers and making them uh, capable of managing their, their, their hinterland connectivity, their, their, their trucks, right, their, their rail operations, uh, stuff like that. Is, 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 is anyone uh, particularly good at that in, in, in the market right now? Or is this the holy grail for digitalization going forward, uh, systemizing and, and optimizing this, say, knowledge of causality, making it yeah. uh, easier for you to operate? Yeah, well, so, so, so when you think it, this is very difficult to insert yourself in the middle with the innovation. Why? Because when I'm a shipper, I'm making my own optimization. I actually do have supply chain planning and optimization tools in place, okay, which link up to my TMS, my transportation management system, and to my ERP, and to my production planning, or maybe even the retail planning, right? So I already have the tools. What I want, I want the decisions that I can use as a constraint in my plan, okay? So I can correctly forecast actually movement of the goods and also allocate correctly the transportation resources that may be required in the middle, right? Between my distribution centers and uh, my regional distribution centers and my local distribution centers and my local distribution centers and the final, final destination. Let's say retail outlet, the same thing for a, for a production facility, right? Especially if I have multiple production facility, I will use one distribution center. And from there, I would allocate my stock based on my production plants. Okay. So I, I do it perfectly, but I need to know actually what is happening with the decision, not where the freight actually is, because that is today. And when I do the planning, I don't do real time production planning. I do it with a week in advance. When I do my retailing planning, the shelf allocation and, and so on, I do it months in advance. Okay, so real time mm. information is really not that critical. Okay, but the decision that was taken that is affecting the arrival times, arrival frequency, or anything like this, that is actually useful because I can use it as a constraint in my planning tool. It's a really good point to make that uh, that that real time as a, as a must have. It uh, it it does sound, uh, but uh, but it it really only gives you like. A, an operational insight into uh, to what happened few days back, few hours back, few months back, as you as you as you rightly put it. So, uh, yeah. so literally uh, having that forward-looking insight and, and and staying closer is uh, is, is of course at, at the yeah. essence of uh, of the right tools to digitalize uh, the yeah. uh, the container shipping business. And 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 if I may. Just segue on that because one thing is, of course, all the uh, the operational excellence that is carried out by many of the actors in the uh, the global shipping supply chains, from from where manufacturing takes place to 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 the warehouse and, and to the the end sale. But but talking about one of the aspects that that also caught our interest in 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 the global news media uh, just a while ago, uh, the crash and burn of trade lens. It is not same, same, but different, but it is definitely also a tool that was set out to enable trade to make sure that some of the um, yeah. the hassle uh, like in in the global business was made easier. Uh, so 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 yeah. what yeah. what happened? Uh, did we uh, did we all of a sudden decide that it was the wrong path to no. uh, to go down? And and is the Chinese rival GSBN now 
now king of the world. How do you see it, Chris? Uh, I see. This is a, this is a, a really good point, right? Because when you think back, uh, how uh, when, I, when I remember the first time when Soren School, um, the CEO of Maersk, went out and started talking about the trade lines and the importance of the trade line. That was at the time when we had a total collapse in the rates. If you remember, essentially the carriers were paying the shippers mm. to take their trade out of Hong Kong. I remember this. The rates were like minus 100 or something like this. Something really unreal. So uh, trade lines were really born in a very, very different time. So trade lines was born specifically to address one of the key issues, which is the no-shows. Because people were finding cheaper rates for somebody else and essentially not showing up on the dock, right? So, so trade lens was introducing the concept of an unbreakable uh, contract, which then every party can back relate to and, and somehow, you know, they can, they can essentially reconcile the fact that you promised me 1,500 containers every, every week of the sailing, but, you know, you're showing up with 300. So what happened with the 12, 1,200 orders? Well, I did ship them, but I found somebody cheaper. So hallelujah, right? So, <laughs> so that was, that was how Soren School, uh, presented that originally. That was a sort of, Tradelands was a solution to that. The second issue with Tradelands was that it was actually also aimed at the car carrier. It was helping essentially carriers to leverage alliance. So if the staff was actually showing up on the dock and the vessel was already, uh, has already left, then maybe I can use connecting services of my partner within the alliance to essentially ship it on, right? So there is exchange of information between the carriers. And if you look at the originally what DCSA did, right? So Digital Container Shipping Association, the standards that it concentrated on, it was all about the movement of cargo between uh, the two carriers or between the carrier and the ground operation, which is essentially terminal. These standards, so, so they essentially picked up the low-hanging fruit at DCSA for the standards, but they didn't touch the hard one, which is essentially, well, how do you exchange the information with the shipper about causality or visibility even of what's, what's happening with the gear, right? So, so again, uh, TradeLens had a good idea. Now, at some point, it got translated somehow into this global orchestration, or sorry, orchestration of global supply chains. Mm -hmm. So here it is. Well, the problem is that the tool has not been designed for that. Okay, so so crash and burn was was not a was not really related to that because the original objective. I, I think that maybe Tradelands actually did meet the original objective. So within the alliance of of like-minded carriers, here it is. How this is how we move the containers around, and this is how we assure that the transit times that we agreed under individual contracts that we have with our customers or somehow met through the, through the forces of the alliance, right? You know, it did ignore the fact that sometimes the uh, code sharing agreements do not exist only within the alliance. There may be extra uh, or outsiders who are also part of the same service. So essentially, at some point, you look at the container vessel and it resembles a, a, a WeWork shared office space, okay? Yes, there is a one code, one IMO, one vessel, but there may be 20 other carriers that pile their stuff on it under the code shared agreement, right? So it will be a PIL, right? The Pacific, uh, Pacific International Lines that will be having their own code share on this. So it looks like their service, but in reality, is it really serve, serviced by, by Maersk or serviced by, by CMA CGF, right? And of course, now when you add that sometimes uh, trade that was traveling on Chinese carriers, right? So Costco, CSL, um, or, or non-trade lens oriented carriers who subscribe to a, a competing blockchain solution or G GBSN. When the trade crossed the, this, this barrier, okay, suddenly we're talking about two blockchains not being able to talk to each other, right? So mm -hmm. another reason why trade lens was maybe ahead of their time but also the fact that the focus has changed comparing to the original objective. And you cannot, th this is a big truck, you cannot make it make a, a turn on a dime to now address this very new objective, which is orchestration of the supply chain. Okay? And that's yes. the reason why Tradelands lived its life. Now, now yeah. it's, it's gone. We probably still need Maybe something like Tradelands to add to it. 
Now, the second thing is now look from the shipper's perspective. The shippers didn't have access to trade lines. You needed to be permission to have access to trade lines. Now, that permission was granted, obviously, to the funding uh, companies, which are the carriers, to associated companies. So let's say like ports or the terminal networks that are serving those yeah. carriers, uh, but not really widely open for permission access to 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 you and I being the BCOs, right? To being the shippers. Mm. We couldn't just simply go in. Now, the idea was that maybe in exchange for our data, they will give access to their data from the trade lines, collected in the trade lines, okay? Uh, but that has never really eventuated into, into much as far as I'm concerned. And that means that, you know, the, the whole model started falling apart, right? Because the commercial intention originally was probably to sell something else. And then it became something else and it was more difficult to sell. If you have a sales force trying to sell trade lines to all potential buyers of the, of the service, well, it becomes, it becomes a very difficult from a sale, selling perspective to put up the message, the go to market, the strategy, you know, uh, r r um, rally new clients and so on. So. We saw the failure. The need still remains over there, right? So there's for, for, for somebody to give me the causality data, okay, that somehow relates yeah. to the data of the actual events, just like the ones that were being collected in the trade lens. But we need a solution that encompasses all carriers. Anything that excludes one group of carriers, okay, it's doomed to fail. To, to me, this is, it was inconceivable that it was conceived as a system that essentially had some carriers, but not the others, okay? And then really, saying, well, we will really permission like, uh, you to join us. Yeah, I, I, I really like uh, this, uh, this uh, point that you make, uh, Chris, so that, uh, that, that you cannot exclude someone from a, from a global network like that. And, and it also, to me, proves a, a real good point in, in terms of uh, the, the challenges that, uh, that also comes along with digitalization and, 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 well, automation of any kind of the business. It is just, it's super challenging. I mean, it, it may be super tempting as well, because at the end of the day, a lot of this is also going down to, uh, to, to, to save cost in the end and to make supply chains move much more efficient and, and, and optimize the whole trades. But, but then again, uh, different systems tumble over different obstacles and in the end of the day some of them crash and burn some of them still yeah. survive but i, I, I mean, would say I, I would say to that point one final know. comment before we move on to another burning uh, topic for for today's podcast uh, chris so um so so uh, be brief please i want to say about sustainability this is very important uh, in the context that we just discussed and mm -hmm. the reason I, I i wanted to tell you this is not about costs okay it's primarily about the time, which costs money. Okay, so yes, yeah. eventually there is a cost, but it's all about the time. Yeah. And when you think mm -hmm. about this, our role of digitalization is really to reduce amount of waste. And if you, if you look at the whole business of logistics, shipping stuff from point A to point B, it's all about essentially wasting. Primarily it's wasting time, right? So there is a yeah. something waiting for something, something not knowing how long to wait for something. Okay, and if we can remove these these overlaps or this this kind of uh, second-hand thinking or or competing thinking, then we reduce the waste. And reducing the waste obviously reduces the cost, right? Mm -hmm. So that way everybody can keep the margin. They're very happy, but essentially stuff moves uh, moves much easier. And sustainability to me, it's all about finding ways to reduce that waste. And primarily it's a waste of time, right? So when you think about digitalization, that, that is the primary thing behind it. And mm -hmm. Trade Lens at some point was trying to be repositioned as that we will orchestrate the supply chain using the data that we have, okay? So that way the interactions between the parties that need to handle the handoffs of your cargo are going to remove and therefore be removed. And therefore your cargo will move much more efficiently through the network. There will be less wasted time, okay? There will be no wait time, there will be no second guessing, okay? So that's a, it's a big impact uh, that, a big connection that exists between digitalization and sustainability, but also the big impact of if the digitalization is not aiming at 
reducing that waste. And that waste is primarily not about the cost, but it's primarily about the time. This is, the, this is I think, how, how we should view sustainability in context of digitalization. And that makes very much sense to me also, because uh, surely you know that, uh, that Sonetta, uh, back in November, launched our carbon emission index, something that would definitely also allow shippers to uh, pick and choose between the various carriers if they were to reduce the carbon footprint of their transportations on a on a global scale so so to me uh, enabling and and bringing this kind of information as uh, as actionable insights for uh, for future uh, decisions uh, is also tagging nicely along your uh, argument uh, from from the very get go here that, that that you need actionable insights not only say, information on what happens right here, right now. You yep. need information to act upon. And, and, and that brings me to, to, to a question uh, here, uh, Chris, because, because how can, well, is digitalization really uh, the enabler of sustainability in the supply chain industry? And by sustainability, I mean mostly cutting carbon emissions, not like yep. the wider cradle to cradle idea or something like that, uh, but, but literally... How can we okay. make sure that carriers deliver what shippers would like, a smaller carbon footprint, yep. transporting the goods around the world? So is this the best way, the only way, or, or no. merely uh, what's around right now? So, so let, let, let me introduce another wor uh, word, or a couple of words. Here. So it's optimization. And when, when mm -hmm. I mean optimization is we use mathematics to essentially design a better path to do something. Optimization projects are incredibly important in digitalization, okay? When you say digitalization, yeah. yeah, you know, some people see it as a portal, okay? Well, what we had manually, you know, 200 reports, now we have a one display, cool display, which, which does this and this, this. That is, <laughs> that, is, that is digitalization in a sense, but that's not digitalization really for, a, for, a, for a sake of optimizing the process. And really what we're after is optimizing the process optimization therefore becomes an integral solution in this. It's not the AI, it's a mathematical optimization, something that we've done, yeah. known, for, known for, for decades. It was difficult to do before because we need computing resources to run optimization runs, okay? But now the computing yeah. power comes much cheap, uh, uh, at much, uh, much lower cost than before. And therefore we can actually do complex optimization that was probably not available to us 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Uh, the methods have improved, the algorithms have improved, our knowledge has improved, and therefore we can do it, we can do it better. But, uh, but here is, uh, here is about, um, sustainability. If you optimize the process, you remove these wait times. So, so today's solution for ESG, right? The, the sustainability yeah. solutions or essentially portals, which tells you, okay, you're sending something from Hangzhou to, um, uh, Houston, Texas. Okay. And I use my mm, distance matrix, right? Uh, which I'm going to calculate the distance. I'm going to calculate the distance on land and assume some sort of emissions by the truck. I'm going to calculate distance port to port. Okay. To calculate emissions based on, you know, some, uh, uh, uh a vest template vessel, right? And then I'm going to do this on the, on the destination leg. I'm also going to do another calculation for the truck doing this transportation to your destination. Okay. Now to me, that is, that is not a sustainability solution, right? Because it tells me, well, more or less, if stuff happens like this based on our distance matrix, uh, this is your emissions. Okay. The shippers, well, that's not the insight. And that's just, Okay, information, it's and it's, by the way, it. it's calculated, right? But here, here, here is what it is. We know that actually when the ship sails, it actually emits much less compared to the ship that waits. So when the ship arrives and waits for three weeks in port to enter the port, okay, it actually burns at that anchorage. It burns actually a significantly more res uh, resources uh, emitting, right, so the fuels, uh, emitting into the atmosphere than it did during the sailing at the more uh, efficient speed, right, of sailing. Now, when the tracker who comes in and expects essentially to pick up the load uh, within three hours, 
idols in front of the gates of the terminal, okay, for 11 hours, okay? The, all these calculations based on a distance matrix do not take this into consideration. But that's where the real emissions, the real pain happens. And by the way, when you're sitting in port, that means you're very, very often within urbanized area. So that stuff goes straight into the households. It affects the public. It's a, it's a quality of life of the neighborhoods around the port. Mm -hmm. That is a big issue. When the truck moves efficiently on the highway, it emits much, much less than sitting, sitting in front of the gate of the terminal idling and waiting for the message saying, yeah, the load is in ready. Come in. Yeah. With your empty. When the ship comes in and uh, instead of being told, say, arrive on Tuesday and I will accommodate you between five and six. That's a preferential window or, you know, five and nine. Okay. The ship arrives and essentially is being told, well, okay, sorry, we're kind of late with handling the previous vessel. Uh, it's another 48 to 72 hours. Well, that's a big idling. That is what the current solutions do not take into consideration. And therefore the shipper has no true insight. So they will be reporting their ESG, their emissions. Okay. For the purpose of. Yeah you know, annual reports and so on, based on these distance matrix calculations, but that is really not the true handling of the sustainability. So we need to m m make a next move, okay, where many of these mm -hmm. solutions become less of a portal, just doing a simple calculation that anybody else can do with the Excel spreadsheet, rather than um, you know, AI kind of thing, which is you know, <laughs> it's a hot topic of the day. Um, and actually make it as saying, okay, this particular carrier, okay, handles the vessels usually with a six days delay and the tracks usually idle instead of one day, they idle about five days, right? I mean, I'm just exaggerating for a, for a, for a purpose of my explanation over here. Therefore, the true emissions from your uh, Mr. Customer, Mr. Shipper, are not based on the distance matrix that the, the stuff travel, but actually on a total wa waste of time that was paid on idling, okay, which has additional costs over and above of what it is. So now, would you mind to, uh, can I suggest you a different combination of different carriers and different uh, combination of carrier terminal and different combination of terminal and a ground transport to actually reduce the idling time because they're better at handling this and use this path and therefore your emissions will be lower. Okay, now think about how cool that kind of digitalization solution is. Comparing to the basic distance matrix calculation saying, well, this is your emission based on the distance I, I calculated your, your freight will travel over. Isn't that something? I, I totally agree with you. That would be extraordinary cool. But I also see, well, it's, it's not just me being old fashioned, but, but that system and that kind of optimization would be revolutionizing, of course. But, the, but there are many steps, I, I'm sure, between where we are now and, and when that will happen. But, but I will definitely be crossing my fingers for that to happen. Well, trade lens, in time because trade lens show sustainability. Yeah, so trade lens actually showed that it's possible to collect the data that is sufficient mm -hmm. for that. The problem is that right. because the trade lens data was used primarily for the carriers One to optimize their behavior versus the customers and the yeah, terminals to optimize their behavior versus the customers, but not really for the purpose of VSG, improving ESG. Uh, and running yeah. AI on top of the data that we had over there. Okay, I, I think that Tradelands showed the way. So, so we, we made some steps towards understanding of what's needed and how we could work on the basis of the data, a solid data that we have, which are the real arrival times, the real performance indicators, and so on. And then from there, derive information with the shippers and the carriers and the ports can actually make a, a common set of decisions to improve overall sustainability, and that is reducing the emissions, reducing time wasted, and reducing the cost of resources that are being idle, okay, while waiting for some connection to occur. I think this definitely serves a very good purpose. I mean, this is super complex doing something like this, but I'm absolutely sure that the combined brain power of, uh, of, of the right people will uh, at some point in time also enable a tool like this to uh, to to come around and I would love to uh, to to bring you back on the podcast uh, Chris when it happens to uh, to uh, to to say that ah this is uh, what you suggested uh, to uh, to uh, as a solution for for the sustainability of the global uh, say end to end supply chains and and now we got it 
So, uh, so, oh. so uh, I'll, well, I'll, for this, I'll keep you hanging on that. For this <laughs> in our industry, we need to get out of this, the short term is that relates to the VC funding. Okay. A VC mm. funding is not building something that is very complex that may take years to return uh, uh, on the investment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it is much more saying, let's put up something, you know, let's, let's try to get in the middle of something. Let's skim the percentage of the transaction. You know, let's get start producing the value right away. So it starts repaying us and the investors behind us. Right. So, you know, because VCs usually use other people's money as well. It's not their money. Um, and, Your and that short term is, it does not work very well in logistics. We, we, we saw this already, like some of, some of the failures in the, in the space from the startups uh, are well funded originally, but they're eventually petering out because they just simply cannot produce enough revenue. They don't have enough scale uh, to satisfy the expectations of VCs who require a certain rate of return based on a, you know, year after year after year until their investment is paid off, right? Completely. And With Chris, nice uh, you, allow, me, allow me to, uh, to see if I can bridge uh, the use and the upside and, and downside of venture capitalists uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the final topic that I would just briefly like to pick your brain on as we are coming in for landing in this uh, Transportation Insight podcast. I am super happy that, that, that you are just thinking out loud on some of the major issues that will affect our industry. Well, that does affect our industry and will definitely also transform the supply chain going forward. And this final topic, as overarching as it may be for many supply chains also, I mean, reshoring and nearshoring of manufacturing. I know that you have also been actively debating this, uh, this topic. So, uh, so, so if we are to conclude our debate here on digitalization with not, with something that may not only be about digitalization, but definitely also about real investments being done in in real locations for yeah. for, for for the greater good uh, of uh, perhaps supply chain resilience, of handling geopolitics, of uh, doing all kinds of stuff that that, that the current supply chains do not have. So uh, so so. Well, how do you see that uh, that going forward, reshoring, nearshoring? Is it something that will actually happen? Is it a lot of talk and, and yeah. no walk because now we are back at square one? Um, please, now so, your mind. So how the, should the, we think about this? The process of reshoring is a is a naturally occurring process, and that is just simply the companies chasing the the lowest possible cost, right? And you've seen the outflow of a certain. Uh, uh, services and production facilities out of China, let's say, going into Southeast Asia, right? Uh, pursuing yep. essentially the lower lower uh, labor cost uh, associated with the unit production, uh, unit production. Uh, whether it's delivered by Chinese company in Vietnam or whether it's delivered by Vietnamese company competing against Chinese companies, is irrelevant in this. So, uh, yep. so now we, we have multiple uh, multiple points of essentially of the or multiple origins for our goods. And you, when you see uh, this uh, playing out, actually, in real life, it's, it's essentially in the United States, where suddenly Los Angeles, Long Beach, which traditionally picked up uh, a traffic from uh, uh, north, um, uh, east, and eastern China, uh, and transferred to the, to the um, uh, west coast United States uh, 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 ports, okay, these volumes started dropping. And in fact, um, you know, for the last, uh, I would say five months, port of New York, New Jersey became actually the largest container port in the United States. Okay. They took it away for, a, for what it appeared to be a month or two from uh, Los mm -hmm. Angeles, uh, Long Beach. And suddenly now they held on to that position and they're now the largest port in the United States. East Coast is more easily accessible to the trade that is coming from Southeast Asia than coming from China, right? Because you're avoiding the Straits of Malacca, obviously, you know, it's just, it's just much faster access. And uh, that means right now that the customer or the shipper or the BCO has actually multiple paths to the same market. They can decide to sail from Asia East and hit the West Coast uh, ports or go West and hit the East Coast ports, okay? Now, what I would like to do as a, as a BCO is make a sustainable decision. So let's say I'm very emissions conscious. I would like to reduce emissions related to the movement of my trade. 
and I don't want to send inefficiently. Well, now I would like to know much more about not where my cargo is, but actually what decisions the carriers will be making about the port calls, about the handoffs of my cargo to the ground transportation or pickup from the ground transportation, and also from the terminals on my network. So that way I can make sustainable decisions, okay, to reduce element of waste and also reduce the cost, my own costs, right? So this is benefit. And in the process, I also reduce the emission. So I avoid, rather than, than going to, to Port of Los Angeles, right? Where I have zero. Can I go to Port of Savannah where I have a six day wait time after the vessel arrives? But this is still more sustainable as in on per emission or per unit of cargo emissions or so on. Um, I would like to know this. Okay. That is very difficult for a shipper BCO to figure out from the current elements or of the current data elements that are provided to them. And it's definitely not provided by the current providers of something what we call visibility, right? So that has to evolve if the shippers and BCOs insist on, on having a much greater understanding of causal uh, effect. So causality, not where my cargo is, which is, <laughs> you know, real time visibility, uh, which by the way, you know, to, to many of those people is, is actually not important. That's the reason why many of these companies trying to outpace each other on the real time visibility. They cannot find the buyers for their solution because nobody plans in real time. When I plan my supply chain, like I, like I said, you know, of 13 weeks. Okay. If I play my production is a two weeks when I plan my production, assuming inventory is already in place. Now imagine if I have international leg overseas, um, in my, in my planning. Obviously I'm not planning mm -hmm. in real time. So what, what does real time information buys me? Real time visibility, but causality, which causes a weak delay or weak change. Well, that is something actually valuable because that has impact on my 13 week planning period. So, um, Chris, so, so Chris I think that's really a lot of stuff over here. A lot of things <laughs> to digest, a lot of things to digest, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of room indicating that there is still innovation that needs to happen, especially if you're really serious about ESG, um, in context of our supply chain operations, then, then one of the cardinal issues to us is, is really solve visibility in a, in a very different way than we're solving this right now or delivering this to the, to the cust willing customers. Or willing to pay uh, to pay for the ongoing service. Chris, thank you so much for sharing all of those thoughts. They definitely brought at least a lot of food for thought for me that I need to digest as uh, as we now come to a conclusion of uh, of this transportation insight podcast. I I think it's fair to say that we could have several episodes debating again and more in depth some of the topics that we have uh, touched on here right now. But I think for many practical purposes, we have to conclude also our debate uh, today, but I would so much love to, uh, to, to continue this dialogue, but I can only also encourage anyone out there, of course, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get in touch with you, to follow you uh, on wherever you share your insights as well as follow and, and, and also uh, get in touch with, uh, with Senator in order also to, uh, to get more visibility and insights, of course, also in, in what happens, uh, not only in real time, what happens here right now, but putting it all into perspective and getting that as actionable insights uh, into uh, to making your decision going forward when you will optimize your supply chains, when you will reduce waste in anywhere in, in the supply chain, be it for, for sustainability or for profitability in the end. Same, same, but different as long as you reach whatever you want to. Chris Kosmala, thank you so much for joining me today on Seneta's Transportation Insight Podcast. Thank you, Peter. It was a real pleasure. It's been more than a real pleasure for me too. And to everyone listening all over, thank you too for joining us today. I hope that you have enjoyed the podcast. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and recommend us and we'll be back next month with a brand new episode of transportation insights thank you to wherever you are and to where everyone <laughs> and uh, take care thank you <laughs>